Thank you for tuning in to today's full episode of the Breaking Changes podcast. I'm your host and chief evangelist for Postman, Ken Lane. With Breaking Changes, we explore specific topics from the world of APIs, but through the lens of business and engineering leadership. Joining me today, we have Tyler Jewell from Dell Capital. Tyler shared with me his unique view of investing across the developer tool chain revealing how he's been tracking on the space for over a decade and what some of the most compelling areas of investment are today and moving forward. Well, I always like starting with the basics. Who are you and what do you do? Hey, Ken. I'm glad to be here. Um, my name is Tyler Jewell. I'm one of the investment managers at Dell Technologies Capital. Uh, DTC is the VC arm of Dell Tech and uh, we focus on uh, investing in disruptive technologies across a range of enterprise technology from silicon network storage, DevOps, data governance, uh, edge, 5G, IoT, machine learning, cybersecurity. Um, and we're one of the most prolific enterprise investors out there. We'll invest about $300 million a year in those companies. And we've got about 140 companies in our portfolio and um, over 60 exits and nine IPOs. Uh, which which puts us in a pretty good uh, range of VC performance, um, and and we're, we've got that performance because we invest financially around themes that we develop rather than on behalf of Dell's businesses. Uh, so we're we're independent, uh, um, and the results reflect on that. Um, and uh, I tend to specialize in developer and DevOps investments, which I've been doing for almost 17 years as an angel and VC. And uh, prior to that, I, I spent. Uh, or at least during some of that period, I was a product operator for 25 years and uh, in and around developer tools and developer platforms at some really interesting companies like uh, BEA, uh, Quest, uh, Red Hat. And uh, I've also had the fortune to run three companies, uh, two of which have been acquired and, and one's pretty large and profitable at this point. Yeah, I've, uh, you know, we, we met a while back at one of your startups and and then kind of stayed in tune over the years about what's going on in the space, what's happening, what's interesting. And you always kind of captured me as someone really with your, your finger on the pulse of dev tools and not just from someone who's had your hands in building them, doing, understanding what's happening. You have a pretty sophisticated approach to, to tracking and understanding the space and not just this year worth of trends. This goes quite a ways back. Can you talk a little bit about how you keep track of the space and understand what's happening? Yeah, uh, when I was starting to do angel, angel investments and investments on, on behalf of Quest, I knew I wanted to do them in rules and platforms. Uh, and my my approach to, to figuring it out was to develop a thesis. And in order to develop a thesis, I needed to see what all the current trends were. And so I, I, I started building a database of every company that I thought was doing something commercially related to developer tools or platforms. Uh, and... Um, and, you know, I'd find companies, um, I'd add them to the database. It was private originally. And, and then I would just track, you know, how many people were working at those companies, what their, you know, uh, revenue targets were, what I thought their revenues were going to be. And then how did that change uh, from year to year? And I, I started that in 2009. So it's been 13 years uh, that I've been building and maintaining that database. Uh, and as I come across new companies or uh, either through introductions or discovery, I, I've just always added it to this database and um, kept the data up to date and then eventually published it for the first time in, I think it was 2020, uh, a couple of years ago. The entire database is available online. Uh, but, you know, with my blogs that I do, in addition to saying, hey, here's the database, there's all sorts of interesting analytics that I can do in and around that information. And it tells me trends about which markets are expanding, which markets are contracting, um, you know, where were the most new company introductions. There's all, there's all sorts of things that you can, you know, glean from that. And uh, it, it's helped inform my own personal thesis around how to develop in this space, uh, but also made a lot of great connections and, um, uh, you know, discover, discover all sorts of insights that I, I wouldn't have had otherwise. So you were, I'm I'm in the middle of my Gartner season, as I would call it right now, where I'm I'm well, and I'm doing the Forrester game as well. But so I'm having to working at a developer tool company, having to speak to these these uh, worlds and convince them of our strong bottom up motion. And 
you feel it feels like you've had your finger on the pulse of developer tools being relevant and important long before everyone else kind of understood uh, or, or sees this. Um, you know, DevOps is 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 a well trodden road now. There's a lot of investments and conversations. What? Why did? Why did you see the potential in developer tools so earlier on when everything else was a was a top down kind of vision being pushed by Gartner's and Forrester's um, and others? You know, look, I don't know if I saw the opportunity or the vision. I, you know, uh, you know, to be honest, I I started doing the work just because I love developer tools and platforms. And um, and it, earlier in my career, where I had built some and I had tried to get the companies I worked for to do more with them. Um, you know, I, I had repeatedly run into roadblocks with that. And the most common refrain was, hey, you know, there's no money in developer tools. And, and that seemed pretty frustrating to me because here you had a, a talent class, a very large talent class and group of people um, who were uh, creative and innovative. And, you know, whenever they saw problems, they would most likely just roll their own. They would want to go build software that solved that problem. And, and so it seemed... Um, uh, to me, that classic business people who were dismissive of developers as a talent class were, you know, mis uh, misunderstanding the opportunity there. And a lot of why I put all this data together is just to help educate others on, you know, look, look, this, there's obviously more going on here than what meets the eye. Um, and, you know, I, I guess I guess in many ways I've been fortuitous because now the market treats it as a top tier investment class. And, uh, you know, they caught up to me and. And I guess I've been the beneficiary of that. Most of my investments over the past 15 years have really have really done well as long as they've kind of aligned to this general trend. So. How do you how do you feel you stay immune to kind of the trendy aspects of 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 any investment? But primarily, I feel like with dev tools, we're starting to see more hyped up trends that may or may not be real. How do you stay immune from from short term uh, trends? Yeah, you, you know, I one, you know, there's a lot of investors who are tracing uh, chasing what I consider historical metrics. You know, like oh, look at the GitHub stars or the growth in the GitHub stars and whatnot. And you know, I, I think that those are superficial metrics, and they're also uh, backwards looking, um, and they're not necessarily reflective of whether there's a real opportunity there or not. So you got to be really careful with that. Uh, what what I do is, um, you know, one, uh, I first I have a kind of a 120 year view <laughs> of the software industry. Um, and I know this is, it, it sounds pretty wild and, it, and it's pretty crazy, uh, but in terms of software construction, our industry, I, I look at it in terms of three waves, each wave being 40 years. Uh, that first wave, which I call the, the waterfall wave, ended um, you know, really at the year 2000. Um, and we're in the second wave now, uh, and I call this the agile wave, uh, which, which is the wave of uh, making changes quicker and getting feedback on a more continual basis. Um, and and I have a I have a hypothesis that we're going to have a third wave that starts to kick in probably around 2035 or 2040. Um, I call it the third wave of industrial software uh, uh, industrialization of the software supply chain. Um, and and that's going to be a, a data driven a data driven uh, approach to constructing and maintaining software. Um, and each of these waves are really forty years. And I think there's plenty of evidence that um, that why these things take forty year cycles with it. And that's my big picture. Um, you know, good good investors I think have to think five to five to fifteen years out. And so um, you know, right now I'm looking at hey we're we're on the you know peak of the second wave, the peak of the agile wave. So I think we've hit peak DevOps. And, and I, I have a lot of uh, hypotheses and theses about what's gonna happen over the next 20 years as this wave starts to wane. Um, and we start to see the emergence of the, the following ones. And I try to invest in and around those, those, uh, those themes. So is there, is there new investments that, that you can make to, to keep writing and investing in the agile one? Or are they, most of the investments that's gonna happen for the next decade are gonna be fueling into the, the data phase? Or, or is there an overlap? Do they work together as far as the, the agile is gonna produce data and, and, and what we need for that next wave? Yeah, I mean, I think when, when you think about these 40 year waves that are broken into two epics, um, and the, first, the first epic, the first 20 years is a fragmentation epic. And, and that's, that's, that's actually really happened here. When I started doing this database 13 years ago, there was only a couple hundred companies in the entire database. 
Um, now there is over 1,300 um, of companies, and these are ones that have not gone out of business. And um, and that and that database has doubled in just a few years, right? So the the total number of companies here um, certainly reflects just the overall interest, but it's also reflected that generally we're seeing fragmentation of the platforms in and around the agile concept. The second half of the epic is a consolidation epic, or the second epic is consolidation based. Um, and so in that sense, there should be a re, you know an overall reduction in the number of companies. Um, favor favoritism uh, given towards platforms um, or systems that that really unify a bunch of complex technologies, uh, things that focus on automation rather than piece parts on that. And you know, and um, uh, and that's investable. Uh, and and that you know that consolidation wave it'll take twenty years to play itself out. Uh, and there's lots of pockets of opportunity for really big companies to emerge that that really play to those uh, those capability sets. Um, and I do that, and at the same time, I've got my eye on what I think that third wave will be. You know, that starts in 15 years, and you know, something that starts in 2035 or 2040. That's a long ways off. That's a bit risky. You know, to put money towards. It. You know, you need to have a 20 year investment horizon, but. You know, you never know. And if the you know right team and you know product and technology come along that plays to that, I I put money to work and you know and then try to help them get there sooner. Well, and so the, on the data aspect of that, so I'm my my background's database administrator. So eighty seven, eighty eight, my first database work, and so I've ridden the waves of of data, and I would I feel like the the different ways that happened, I felt like we were pretty played out data wise until recently I started seeing um, data at a scale, I would say, and it's not the, 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 the Hadoop and, and, and kind of these data tools. It's, it's the data exhaust from some of the operational level stuff you talked about that, that are contributing to agility, um, performance, velocity. So it's CI, CD pipeline data. How do you, how do you help developers be more, you know, optimize there? It's gateways as the gateways are commodity, commoditized. How do you ma measure velocity and release, uh, there and optimize that to, GitHub Copilot, you know, is not uh, about the AI or the ML. It's about the data and what you learn there. So what are you seeing on the data ops, data, you know, ML side? What's what's interesting with data right now that you feel is kind of priming the pump for this 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 future that you speak of? Uh, well, you know, the, the amount of data being created that uh, uh, incomprehensible comprehensible scale at this point, I think that that um, that level of scale has caused the data industry to rethink, you know, what are good data structures in order to you know, manage all that sort of data. And that's why you're seeing the integration of that. Um, that's, that's one driver. Um, the second driver is, is that there's a, um, a, a theory out there that says if every company is going to be a software company, then, you know, the only differentiation you have as a company is going to be the quality of your software. And uh, most companies are going to be able to produce software of an equivalent quality. And so how do you differentiate? And you tend to differentiate through your machine learning algorithms. Um, and with your machine learning algorithms, well, guess what? You know, the models are all probably going to be commoditized, but the data set that you use to train those models with might be proprietary and unique and ultimately, you know, make one product better than the other. So you, you look at that and going like, hey, if, if it's machine learning that's going to be the you know, fundamental differentiator of all software in the future, then my personal proprietary data set that I have, which is feeding into that, is my entire company. And so I need to hoard the data. I need to generate a lot more higher quality data. I need to make sure it's cleansed and, it's, you know, um, and that I'm using the right models, which are completely explainable. Um, and so that's a huge you know, uh, catalyst there. And, and so to your specific question, so I think that the, you know, the, the, just the amount of data and the different types, that's driving a rethink of data architectures, you know, a whole new category of data architectures. And we're in the earliest stages of that. Um, there's tons of VC money that's flowing in there. And then, you know, because machine learning is going to drive so much, um, I think ML ops is certainly a category that organizations are struggling with because they need, um, and, and, and there's no winner there. There's dozens, if not, there's like 35 to 40 companies that are trying to play around in the ML ops space, whether they're focusing on developers or maybe the data scientists or whoever it is. But there's no winners. Um, 
and they're all trying to figure out what is what is you know what is if you will the agile for ML ops. What's going to be that standard workflow? Um, and in, you know, is there going to be a platform for this? And you know, and right now it's a it's a all out all out battle to see to see who's going to establish that at the end of the day. Yeah, and the it like you said, it's a lot of it's going to be the model based. So so ML ops, but also model ops. How do you optimize the the usage of these models and evolution of them? But with a with an eye towards your data, and and I know a lot of folks. We had Ford on last season, and they talked about you know the data opportunity for training models um, on fleet data and just driving around on a daily basis, doing deliveries, trying to make sense of, of, of that world and equipping folks with, with the, the ML skills they need to do that, to generate the data and iterate and, and, and on the models and what's going on. So do we have the skills we need in the enterprise to be doing all this? Is it this, cause it seems like data scientists are pretty hard uh, group to cultivate. You can only produce so many data scientists, but do we have this, the ML skills and the data skills we need to kind of get to the next level with this? I think the whole industry is catching up. Uh, I mean, ML, ML, and ML ops as a, as a skill set is you know since we don't have standards on how, what you know what the right processes are that we, if not you know productizing that, they are definitely experimenting with it. Um, and and as we've seen from other waves of paradigms that get introduced, you know it's a good 10, 10 to 20 years before organizations, you know, mature and how they apply a new paradigm to it. So I, th I think we're in the earliest stages for what it's worth. I mean, we've got a long ways to go and, um, and that's pretty darn exciting. Um, there's certainly not as many data scientists and data engineers on the planet as there are software developers. Um, you know, now, uh, if you are doing data science uh, for the purposes of analytics, um, and you can work in a silo, that's great. But if you're doing data science and machine learning because you want to have, um, uh, you know, capabilities, inference capabilities or other sort of capabilities that are features of an application that your developers are working with, you've now just compounded the problem because now you have to intermingle uh, what is an agile uh, uh, release process for software uh, coupled with you know, a, a machine learning model that's continuously going through training of data that, that also is getting monitored and um, whose tuning could absolutely change the behavior of the application itself. So you now have these two teams with these two completely different sort of processes that have to figure out how to work together um, uh, for the common interests of your end users. There. And, and it feels like the tools are what's going to matter here because I'm not going to be able to get my team developing all the skills in all, in all these areas they need. We need the tools to augment them with, with the, the abilities they need. I, I think it's a little bit of the tools for sure. You know, a tools that help create guardrails and process collaboration. Um, I, I also think that uh, there's a lot of uh, knowledge that has to gain in how you uh, manage your data which is, you know, it has nothing to do with the tape tools. I mean, the, the, the quality of the data, the freshness of it, um, how often you're dealing with training, um, you know, that, that's just going to be something, guess what, developers and data scientists have to become specialists in this now, whether they like it or not. And, and then there's an infrastructure problem too, um, which is why, you know, Databricks is so valuable uh, because, you know, just having the data and having the model isn't sufficient. Uh, training that model and doing it at scale, there is a, you know, uh, a responsiveness of that and then the cost of the scale out infrastructure needed to do that. Um, and, you know, and frankly, you have to be at pretty significant scale for these models to get, uh, you know, accurate enough where people feel comfortable about putting them out in front of end users at the end of the day. And this is in our lack of a better word, our grandfather's AI. This isn't Watson, massive brain. You just feed a bunch of data into it. it this is much more modular, flexible, ever changing. This isn't a destination, oh, we have the model trained, we're good. This is a perpetual motion going forward. Yeah, right? so, mo models age, and then the data that we use to train that model with it. So is there life cycle and governance concerns? I mean, I'm neck deep in that with just APIs, but... Is there a whole life cycle and governance yeah. way yeah. of thinking of that's emerging? Yeah, there's. I mean, there's certainly a bunch of vendors who are just 
focused on the explainability of AI. Um, you know, and there's all sorts of, but if, if you've got an inference and it gives you a result, um, you know, what was the quality of the data that was used to um, infer that result? Was the data uh, legal? You know, was there no PII information in there? Um, you know, how does this result compare to the quality results given to other people? Um, in some cases, you know, you have to have um, uh, traceability of, you know, how did the algorithm kind of conclude that this was the result that's there? I mean, so there's any, any number of issues that are on that. And um, you, you also then need to be able to trace uh, quantifiably, you know, how an algorithm is degrading over time, you know, because it, it, it falls off, you know, an asymptotic sort of curve there. Um, and so you've got to monitor that. And if it falls below certain thresholds, then you've got to make changes or remove it or, you know, whatever that may be. Yeah, I mean, you touched on observability. It feels like there's going to be, you, you know, mentioned traceability. It seems like observability at this layer is going to be pretty key. But are you seeing regulatory creep into this as well? Is there any anything that's government uh, compliance that you're seeing gonna gonna influence how this how we move forward? I, I'm sure there is, but I haven't been monitoring that. Yeah, I'd like to tune into that because I feel like data wise. It's definitely a concern. API wise, we're starting to see banking, healthcare regulations emerge as far as what you can have. But it seems like with some of the backlash around um, ML, that there's going to have to be more observability and, and compliance. And any, I mean, think about it. Any any time there's a piece of data that makes a life decision, you know, if that if that data is there and they've influenced the life decision, it's it's inevitable that it'll have to be regulated. Yeah, yeah. No, I have to look, I have to think about your 40 year model and maybe spend, uh, you know, n 1960 through 2000 and go what, what tech regulation existed and then bring some of that research, share with your, your, your database, see what I can contribute there. That's something I'm trying to tune in more and understand. Um, so we talked a little bit about the, the, the skills and the resources and, and, and the tools that are going to be augmenting people. Is there do you see opportunity in here for non-developers because there's only so many developers in the world um i and and it feels like we're going to need business stakeholders uh stewards of some of this data from a business domain being involved in some of this this work do you is low code no code um getting the traction that you think it should that 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 it, some investors are are saying that it, that it, that it has well, you know, if if you know, one of the premises of what happens between a fragmentation epic and a consolidation epic is that um, uh, while the original founding principles that drove that wave have now been validated, um, you you through the fragmentation process, you've now introduced um, unnecessary complexity, if you will, around you know a bunch of different tools and processes that optimize individual components of that principle. Right. And so so, you know, this idea of peak DevOps also kind of implies that we're at peak complexity for what it takes to uh, build, construct, maintain these software systems. And even though a developer today can build something in an hour that would take them many days to have built, you know, two decades ago, um, uh, the rest of the process, if you will, the communication, the tools, the languages, everything else in maintaining that may have introduced a lot more complexity than they were willing to bargain for. Um, and so, so how do you address complexity? Well, you know, complexity is addressed through automation. Um, and there are uh, over a dozen different forms of automation that exist in and around the DevOps world. Um, and one of them, one of them, and probably the most dominant one is low code, no code. And it's wild. I think there's something like 130 companies in that database. Of 1,300, 130 of them we've classified as low-code, no-code companies. And there's more than a handful of them that are well over $100 million of ARR. So, um, and, and there's a, you know, a pretty decent set that's between five to $20 million of ARR. So you've got a lot of companies You've got, you know, instead of one or two dominant ones, you've got a whole pile of companies who are really doing well at scale. And, and all the indications are is that these companies are just getting warmed up, that, that, you know, there's a whole category or class of systems that need to be built that people would just prefer to do it with a low-code system as opposed to a traditional way. 
You feel like the the notion of what is an application is going to kind of be blown away in this in this new reality? Because I mean, historically, it's I usually paint the picture as web apps. You have desktop apps as well. Then we had mobile apps, and then now we have some more uh, device internet of things. But then the the network is is programmable now. So, like, do you feel like the the notion of what is an application is 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 radically different now? Oh, uh, you know, uh, not 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 personally, no. But I'm sure that your your listeners, you know, probably do feel that way. You know what I what I do what I do see is that I, I've always said that APIs are the only universal application that exists out there, right? It's the only universal GUI, um, and that and that you know most systems that are going to be built, you know, are going to first be built as an API, and then you might have some clever you know uh, user interface mechanisms to go to go along with that separately and independently of that, um, and. You know, I did some back of the hand math, and my guess is if you take everything that's getting exposed over the internet that is also programmable, however you define programmability in this regard, we're, you know, by the end of this decade, there will be well over a trillion live, active, programmable endpoints on the on the internet there. You know, you know, whether it's your phone or it's some, you know, API hosted API provided by a vendor, or it's an IoT device that has some accessible inter- I mean, you pick your poison, a trillion programmable endpoints. Um, that's, you know, that's a lot of services that are going to be out there that have to be managed. And, you know, frankly, low code is probably the the best way to, you know, connect to and integrate, um, you know, all those different endpoints. Yeah, pl- uh, platform scale is the only way we're going to discover those things, know where they are to even use them how we're going to put them to use, how we're going to monitor their health and, and reliability, observability, traceability, know, know when it's breaks, all of those things. Because um, the number of APIs I use are just through the roof. It's not it's not hundreds anymore. It's not tens or hundreds. It's thousands of APIs, and, and I cognitively can't keep up with that. So I need tools to help me make sense of this world. And on that point, you can't cognitively keep up with just the number of APIs that you're using. How are developers supposed to cognitively keep up with a modern day system when that modern day system is uh, microservices, right? Which are lots of different independently moving parts that are all potentially communicating with one another. Uh, uh, A heavily fragmented tool chain uh, an agile process that encourages you to make more changes because you can get more feedback. So now you have to do continuous feedback, uh, which is a lot of data to observe, uh, comprehend, and process, right? Um, and, you know, because there's now 1,300 different vendors out there, you have to have some reasonable expectation of kind of uh, uh, studying what's new and keeping up and educating yourself. And so, you know, one of the things that I look at and go, how can a reasonable person comprehend the impact of a change that they want to make and then make changes on a continual basis in this in this world? Right. Um, uh, And I I think that it's ultimately going to lead to a path of not being sustainable unless you have a really small system where you can keep it all straight in your head. Uh, but, you know, any sort of system of reasonable complexity, it's going to be int- difficult to main- maintain some organizational structure. And and you go, well, that just doesn't strike me as a good good thing for our industry. So so would rethinking our fundamental principles and having machines uh, do the change reasoning for us uh, uh, with intent provided by humans, would that be a better overall approach on how uh, we build and maintain software systems versus the way we do it now. Yeah, that really that touches on a whole lot of the world that I see moving and shaking right now. Cause uh, back to the platform argument, I can't make sense of this world. I can't understand. I mean, I can't understand all the direct services being used, let alone the dependencies of those services. And so we had uh, one of the conversations I had yesterday was around breaking changes title of this show but how do you know if i add a property or change this property what are the impacts 
who's going to scream, who's, who do I need to talk to? How do I, how do I do that preemptively yep. in a large scale system? I can't do that today in most <laughs> enterprise environments. Now in the data, in the data world, uh, there's data catalogs, which are basically large systems that aggregate the metadata about uh, how those data systems are uh, used and, consu- and the data is consumed. And it's amazing to me that we don't have the parallel in the developer world, which I, which I call a service catalog, and I've written about this. And it strikes me as inevitable that much the way that Alation and Calibra have now become these billion-dollar um, unicorns that focus on data governance, that we're, we're going to need to have service governance really emerge. And um, in, in, in service governance, the product would be a service catalog, which is the aggregation of uh, metadata, not just about the process and the teams like backstage from Spotify, but metadata about the systems themselves, you know, their communication paths and, you know, where they're deployed and how it's architected and all sorts of stuff like that. And and that metadata can inform people to make better decisions, but it can also inform the tools as well so that the tools can start taking on some of these decisions and, and understand the, the potential impact as well. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, I see a couple startups emerging. I've been a, a part of several waves of these, whether it's discovery, I, I don't like to use that phrase because a lot of people think search engine or search just catalog, but discovery from like a circuit break pattern, service mesh type, you know, automated understanding of not just the interfaces and the services, but as you said, the operations around them, the teams around them, the reliability, the overall scalability and 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 health and 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 whether i should be depending on this because if i'm going to put it introduce it into my system as a dependency i need to know i need some guarantee some assurances that it's reliable not just an sla i need some some track record some history that i can that i can go on so it's pretty important exactly yeah so i've seen several folks come along with ratings agency you know, folks, for for lack of a better phrase, standard and poor's, yep. but for services, trying to understand um, this this wealth and, and and the health of this catalog and what's what's possible. But I have yet to see something emerge that that helps us uh, properly manage risk at this level and understand it within just the services we depend on, let alone understand the myriad of third party services and and other de- external dependencies that we have. So what gets you excited about investing today? What's, uh, uh, aside from the investments you've made, what's, what are you, what are you getting worked up about and thinking is, is, is going to be hot next? You know, I, I can do a little bit to try to you know, make those things happen, find those companies there. But the big, the big thing that gets you excited about investing today is the teams that you invest in, the people that you get to work with. Um, and that, you know, I think early on when I started investing, I just invested in the idea. Um, and as I've gotten older and, you know, you realize that time is kind of really precious. Um, you know, a single investor really can only do deep investments in, you know, 10, 10 or 11 or 12 companies. Um, and you're going to spend a lot of time, hundreds, if not thousands of hours with the, with the founders, uh, help, helping them achieve their, their dreams and their desires and their vision. Um, so you really got to, you know, get excited by the people, um, believe in them and see yourself as part of their team. Uh, and that's what you look for. Yeah, agreed. That's, I would say the ideas don't matter much to me. I'm always looking for people who don't just get the tech, but have a passion for whatever they're building, have a genuine curiosity, interest, have a certain amount of work ethic. I mean, I would say COVID has kind of revealed for me a lot of, um, I don't know what, what our motivations and incentives are all about. And, and some people who, um, may, may or may not be in it for the long run. We'll just say, you know, and, and are, are struggling with, with delivering at a scale. I think that's, that's needed today. So it, for me, it really comes down to the people. I'm, I've seen enough APIs. I've seen enough startups successful, not successful. It really comes down to the, the, the personalities and the people and, and, and the stories that they, they, they tell about what they're building, how they're building it, what, and what's going to matter. So most people who take the risk and the leap of, of starting a company, the founder, who almost universally come across as great work ethic, very passionate, you know, willing to climb the mountain. 
Um, I, I'm curious, like, do you, do you do you come across founders from time to time who really, you know, got into it for the wrong reasons there and that they're not really? Yeah. Yeah. I've seen a few that um, believe they had the right technical solution. They, and it, it was, they learned the hard way that that doesn't really always exist, let alone apply at scale in whatever industry they're doing. And, and they were unable to come to terms with that. And um, so they thought they had the, the, the right technical answer and that it would just translate into business uh, revenue and, and it would just make sense. And it didn't, it needed a, a wider story. It needed much more than just the technical. Um, but then I've seen some who are just, doing it just because they want to be CEO and they don't really care about the thing. But uh, I've also seen a lot where they're really, they're really believers and they, they buy in it. I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm at Postman is, is, is because that exists here. And uh, I really, really trying to understand what people need and trying to find, you know, find, I mean, we just celebrated yesterday a decade of when Avanov, our CEO posted, uh, the Chrome extension on the Stack Overflow message. Um, I tweeted it out yesterday, but it was that first Chrome. Hey, we're trying to solve a problem for developers here. You can't see API, so it's not API testing. It was troubleshooting, trying to make sense of this very abstract, invisible world with this Chrome extension by adding this layer to what you could see. And now it's become this whole platform that that does the same thing, but at scale. How do you see APIs? And I think any Anybody who really cares about helping folks see this digital, you know, any part of this digital transformation that that we're in is going to be valuable. But it's got to be someone who's willing to do the mining, the hard work to understand what C means and what out of all of this noise, what's the actual signal, what matters the most. And those are the people I think that I would be investing in, but I'm not an investor. So how's COVID changed anything for you? Has it changed any of the way you work, the way you, you interact, interact with people? What's changed? Well, you know, uh, the idea, you know, pre-COVID of outlaying millions of dollars um, into a company without having spent, you know, a lot of time with the people, um, you know, not just on phone calls, but at their offices you know, uh, in social environments, getting to know the founders. Uh, that was just a, a, a non-starter. Like the idea of not being able to study the individual, build the relationship, um, and go through those those normal mechanisms prior to putting that much money to work, it was incomprehensible. And, you know, through COVID, now the entire life cycle has been done digitally, virtually. And, you know, we we invested... Uh, gosh, you know, probably four hundred million dollars over the past twenty four months, and didn't meet anybody, didn't shake anybody's hand, you know, through that. Uh, so that's a, a pretty wild uh, concept. I, I hope that it's going back to normal. Our office just opened up last week for the first time. We were all there. It was wonderful to hug my coworkers. Um, uh, we actually had entrepreneurs come into our office and get to meet. The energy is just very different after two years of having to do everything digitally and remote. Uh, putting people into a room, having a whiteboard available. Uh, there's a tangible, there's a tangible feeling that you can get. And so you definitely get a different read. Um, so I, I, I hope we come to some sort of hybrid uh, understanding of this. I don't know what that looks like, but uh, you know, I think we, hopefully it's not all, it's not all zoom and it's not all in person and there's something in between. Yeah. Agreed. I did my first, did a, a Stripe, uh, the Stripe team was in town and they had a little shindig. I went to it. It was the first in-person thing I've done in a while. And it was, uh, it was interesting. It was, it was good, but it was definitely uh, going to take some practice, I think, for me to get back to it. Um, so I'm fascinated by your, your database strategy, how you manage your information. How do you stay in tune with things? What do you use to gather information and, and stay aware of what's going on? Uh, you know, every morning I do, um, I, I read through a list of hundreds of, uh, feeds from companies and, um, smart people out there. Um, that gives you lots of insights, lots of threads to go pull and chase. Um, there's lots of discoverability that comes from just doing that exercise. Um, two, because of, 
you know, who we work with, I, you know, I get updates on all the different fundraising events. Um, and so that gives me signal to companies that maybe I wasn't aware of before. Uh, three, a lot of networking with other investors and other interesting entrepreneurs. You know, we have uh, over 100 entrepreneurs in our network, uh, founders, and they, they also are looking at the ecosystem and giving us insights. Um, and, uh, and then I've also got, you know, 15 partners here at Dell Tech Capital who are doing similar sorts of things. And so all, all that together leads to, you know, um, a bunch of data points uh, that, that are coming in each and every day. I like it. Yeah, yeah this... I, I, I'm not good on on Twitter. I, I you know there's a lot of people who are fantastic on Twitter, you know, but I I just find that overwhelming. But I think I think there's some investors who just live by that. That's how they build all the relationships. Yeah, I'm I'm good at the Twitter, but I have to say there's there's some diminishing returns there. LinkedIn, um, I've been pushing on them, and they're doing a good job of it, evolving their API to make it as robust as Twitter's so that I can understand the signal versus noise on LinkedIn. But LinkedIn's kind of trumping me for for uh, tapping into what's happening. It's 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 been interesting. I didn't anticipate that after the Microsoft acquisition. So, um, well, I think we covered most of it um, that I wanted to see. I really appreciate your time today. This was uh, enlightening. I love, I love hearing your view. I'd love to get together for in person again at some point, um, be able to hear and keep talking through the space because I've got some other startups and areas I would love to explore with you. But I really appreciate your time today. Thanks for sharing your approach and, and how you see things. Oh, I'm glad to be here. It's great to hang out with you, Ken. Yeah, anytime. Uh, I will, uh, I'll be in touch and see if we can't bring you back for some other conversations. But if you're seeing any anything interesting, feel free to to ping my way as well. And um, until then, I appreciate it. All right. Sounds good. Take care. Thanks again to Tyler for stopping by. You can find more about Dell Capital at DellTechnologiesCapital.com. And you can find Tyler on LinkedIn. You can also subscribe to the Breaking Changes podcast at Postman.com slash events slash breaking dash changes. I'm your host, Ken Lane, and until next time, cheers.